Hi, hello everyone. I'm sorry for the delay, some technical problems here. But uh, we're going to start. Uh, this is the keynote session number three uh, with uh, Bilal Sukkar. Just some moments here. This is our last day. I take this opportunity to thank you all. Uh, okay, let's talk about Bilal. Uh, I've known Bilal Sukkar for many years now, and uh, I have had the honor to be on his uh, PhD thesis examining committee back in, pff, I can't remember when. Uh, but Bilal has this uh, unique combination of uh, an, uh, an analytic mind and, uh, and uh, this synthesis ability together with uh, organizational and visual design skills, uh, making him uh, an ideal person to firstly, to develop and publicize the BIM framework. And now to expand this, that effort into something uh, which a uh, much bigger scope and general usefulness, both to companies and governments. Uh, this great initiative is uh, what we'll talk about now. Uh, now a more formal introduction to, uh, to him. Um, Dr. Bilal Sukar is a strategic uh, being consultant with extensive experience in performance assessment and improvement. He is a highly cited researcher in the fields of competence-based learning and macro beam policy de de development. Between 1994 and 2004, Bilal worked as a designer, team leader, and site manager on major contracts in Australia and in the Middle East. Uh, before focusing his attention on digital innovation, performance assessment, and process improvement. In 2004, he established Change Agents AAC, an open innovation BIM consultancy. In 2009, Change Agents developed BIM Excellence, a unique research-based method for assessing, benchmarking, and improving the competency of individuals, capability of organizations, and compatibility of uh, project teams. This was followed in 2016 by the not-for-profit BIM Excellence Initiative which includes numerous esteemed academics and consultants from across the world. The Bing E initiative includes many projects uh, such as the, the Bing Dictionary, Macro Bing Adoption, Bing Competency, and Integrated Information Platform projects. Academically, Bilal studied business administration, design, and arts before undertaking postgraduate post studies in organizational behavior and human research management. In 2013, he completed his PhD, focusing on beam performance assessment at the University of Newcastle, Australia. Bilal published many peer-reviewed award-winning articles and are amongst the highest cited in the beam domain. Dr. Sucker participated in industry-wide initiatives, including the Australian CRCCI National Guidelines for Digital Modeling in 2008, and in the AIACA Bean Education Working Group. Below delivery, many keynote speeches, uh, lectures, and workshops around the world, including in New Zealand, US, UK, China, Malaysia, Qatar, Hong Kong, Singapore, Spain, Italy, Chile, and Brazil. Bilal, welcome. The stage is yours. Oh, thank you, Eduardo. Um, and sorry all for, for being uh, late. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, to, to be presented by my dear friend, uh, Eduardo, or some of you know, you know, know him as uh, Toledo. Um, yes, he, he did review my PhD thesis. <laughs> he, he, I don't know how many errors he discovered, so, so thank you again. Eduardo, you've uh, always been uh, my go-to person uh, when something really needs to be uh, forensically uh, analyzed. Um, and thank you for the invitation to present today. Um, I was enjoying the chat, but uh, maybe now we could jump into um, 
PowerPoint. Maybe if you don't mind, if you can share my screen. Oops. Okay. All good, just to take, uh, because I can't see StreamYard here. All good, continue. Yeah, go on. Okay, so my apologies. Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead. Um, today's uh, session uh, has a title called Facilitating Digital Transformation Through a Common Knowledge Sharing Model, uh, an International Community Effort. There's so much to cover uh, about this topic, and it's really impossible to summarize it in, uh, you know, 40 minutes, 60 minutes even. And I will, I will uh, put some links uh, for people who are interested in, in these topics to, to later uh, watch a few videos, uh, which we recorded as part of our first Excel seminar less than a month ago. So it's still fresh. So. Um, this is the synopsis of the presentation. I'm going to introduce the BIMI initiative or BIM Excellence uh, initiative, um, its structures, projects, and community. Um, but in, in this presentation, I'm going to be focusing as much as possible on the knowledge structures because, uh, you know, this is an academic presentation. Of course, uh, I need to focus on conceptual issues, but also because uh, there's so many other presentations that uh, people attending could go back to, to look at the projects, uh, their interconnectedness, uh, the volunteers, etc. cetera. Uh, I'll just briefly touch upon uh, the importance of community-based research activities. I mean, wh why, why is this community needed and similar communities are needed? Um, I'm hoping that by, by the end of today's session and maybe our discussion, uh, you will see that there is a place for, for this type of work. And at the end, I will invite like-minded uh, researchers and to, to join, uh, and if not join, to create something similar or better. And, and because I truly believe that through community-based work, um, we can do a, a lot more of independent, independent research that is not really, um, that could complement what's happening currently in our industry and academia. So it's uh, five parts. So first part would be you know, quick introduction to the initiative, uh, then the knowledge structures which enable the initiative uh, to, to, to operate. Um, introduction, very quick introduction to projects and, and deliverables, and uh, also a quick introduction to the community and network, and some limitations and discussions, mostly challenges that that something like the BIMI initiative community faces and tries to address. Um, so first introduction, when we say BIMI initiative, of course, it's building information modeling, excellence initiative, BIMI initiative for short, it's a very long uh, name. And when we use the term BIM, again, just as a reminder, it is the broadest ever um, definition you could find about BIM. It is about the current uh, expression of digital innovation uh, you know, across the built environment. Uh, it is just a language of discussing this digital transformation process innovation. Um, if you want another def uh, academic definition, if you wish, it's all the, the technologies, the processes, and policies that enable everything, design, construction, operation. So, so it includes every term that you can think of when it comes to digital transformation within the built environment. Uh, quite broad, intentionally broad, <laughs> because it will have a, a longer shelf life. And you can see from you know the past uh, you know, month, let's say less than a year, there's new terms that come and position itself as as that uh, um, a, you know key term that everyone needs to research uh, under its under its umbrella. So so really, it's very important to keep uh, terms as broad as possible. So initiative is a not-for-profit knowledge generation effort. So it's not-for-profit. Um, it's you know led by volunteer researchers. And when I'm using the term researcher here, uh, it means uh, people from both academia and industry. Um, you know, and you know, there's really excellent researchers that are, don't work in academia, as we all know. And to qualify as a researcher under the BIMI initiative, you, know, you need to be a specialist and adopt a rigorous means in, in, in developing your research deliverables and in announcing your results and being open and transparent about your method and output. 
it is a community led um you know you'll see it's lots of people involved um uh, it's kind of an alternative to 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 what we hear you know coming from authorities top down telling us that this is how you should think about these topics this is the the you know the standards you should follow this is the the policies you should adopt it is kind of a um you know complementary approach thing it's important to also think about it bottom up if we say if we can use that term um and offer something that comes from industry up to policy uh, it's a it's a kind of coherent response this is the the whole uh, you know intention behind this type of work is is so, so it's uh, coherent it is interconnected uh, we'll see meaning maybe you you know you find the the discussion uh, leading in ways that is incoherent but this is this is uh, you know the, the the effort is always renewing or being renewed to keep the co coherence and the connectedness of all the research within the initiative. It is partially supported by commercial organizations. Uh, I will acknowledge them at the end. And this is very important for developing tools, meaning uh, typically we don't uh, need much financial support and we try to, to do work that doesn't really need uh, financial support as much as possible, rely on volunteers and their efforts. But when developing uh, online tools, uh, we need to hire, um, you know, uh, contractors, uh, you know, back-end developers, front-end developers, you know, more about, it's all about software development and maintenance. What are the deliverables? You know, we have static and, you know, deliverables like matrices and lists or you know, macro assessments and reports. I'll go through them a little more detail later on. Uh, a very important output is modular workflows uh, for process engineering, engineering and re-engineering and open access uh, tools. And we could have a discussion why open access, not, not open source. So, what are the industry challenges that the BIM initiative is trying to 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 you know address, to answer, to provide uh, some kind of uh, discussion about? And we can go through tens, if not hundreds, of challenges. But uh, the things that uh, you know need highlighting uh, in this presentation is that we all know that our industry in the built environment, the construction industry, is lagging behind. Okay, there's you know hundreds of reasons. I would say. Uh, one of the most important one is the disintegration of the supply chain or you know lack of integration. Uh, there are pressures to increase productivity, meaning uh, you know all other industries are increasing their productivity. Also, we could discuss whether productivity in the construction industry has stagnated or not. You know, in in my view, it is improving, but uh, it's not improving as fast as other industries. Um, there are conflicts. Uh, when trying to marry, you know, combine, align emerging tools, and there's so many emerging uh, tools and technologies uh, with legacy processes. And this is really one of the main challenges faced is that we have all these new things, all these uh, beautiful tools, beautiful approaches, and then we try to um, put them in a, in, a, in a legacy process. Like, uh, let's try to understand these new digital tools and uh, workflows, uh, but Rather than trying to ad adapt, adopt uh, new processes that uh, would benefit from these uh, emerging tools, we try to box them into our legacy processes and put them into even to static standards, which take years to, to develop and uh, many years to change. So there are missed opportunities for engaging other researchers from outside academia. And this is very important. This, this has been, I mean, I've always been, I mean, I've, I've, I've worked in academia, but uh, and many of us have worked uh, in academia and worked in industry, and we all know that somehow we speak different different uh, type of language, which uh, pre you know, pre prevents us from benefiting from each other. So, so BIMI Initiative tries to address this challenge um, in multiple ways, and hopefully I'll be able to cover many of them. Another challenge is the there's a lack of competency in, in, in digital means um, and methods, and we need to address this um, urgently. So it's not just about adopting new tools. Uh, and we've seen that even when adopting new tools and, and, and workflows, and if there's not enough uh, diffusion of the right co competencies, um, 
there are significant risks faced uh, by our industry. So to meet uh, some of these challenges, um, we have to do research, of course. Um, but it's not just you know enough to do research. We have to develop. We have uh, you know to develop solutions. We have to test these solutions, continuously improve them. So I'm going to present uh, the BIM Excellence Initiative approach, the, the BIMI approach. Um, hopefully, uh, you'll see that we're trying to think about these problems in a in a fresh way. Maybe maybe it's not an original way. I don't know. I'm trying to think about all these problems and try to connect them with solutions and try to keep these solutions connected. So these challenges, uh, the, the BIM Access Initiative, the BIM Initiative uh, will try to address by focusing on what's common. Okay, so so there's lots of challenges faced by our industry, you know, by academia, industry in different jurisdictions. And we can focus on what's unique in each country or in each region, or we can focus on what's common. Uh, the BIMI initiative focuses on what's common. This is very important, and you know this is strategically important because if we could address what's common, uh, that would be a, a major win for all. Uh, if we only focus on what's local, what's what's unique, then that would be, of course, benefit to to the, what's local and what's unique, but it's not won't, won't be of benefit um, at all. We'll focus on you know complementarity. Uh, you know, as we know, experts uh, like to work in isolation. It's, uh, that's the. Uh, I, I could if I, I if I if I label myself as an as an expert, you know, I would say that I'd love to work alone. You know, that's that's it's so enjoyable to to work alone. But uh, you there's not not much impact in working alone. There's not much benefit to the to the community to the industry in working alone. So we need to attract these experts. Uh, and, and give them something to, to work together on and um, allow them to, to deliver uh, uh, common uh, solutions. Flexibility, um, emphasis on process standardization is, is, let me say it's rampant at the moment in our uh, discussions. You know, it's all about standardizing this, standardizing that. And, and, and I don't hear mean standardizing componentry or specifications of products. I mean, uh, trying to uh, standardize processes, you know, steps that people take to exchange information, to exchange, to share knowledge, etc. There's a lot of uh, focus on standardization, which I, I think is really counterintuitive and a, a big risk to process innovation. Of course, we need both standardization and we need flexibility uh, in adopting new processes, but we, we, need to, uh, we would like as an initiative to err on, on the side of uh, flexibility and innovation, because there's so many, uh, much effort by others to focus on standardization. Complexity, you know, continuously, you know, you know, increase, uh, you know, with even with the adoption of, of what people consider to be intuit intuitive tools. Um, it just, you know, whether you're using, uh, you know, BIM tools and workflows or any 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 kind of uh, combination of BIM and GIS and PLM, and you can add uh, hundreds of other terms on top. There, there's lots of uh, complexity. Um, and the, the, it's not really being reduced by, by all this. So we need to focus on finding ways to reduce that complexity. And our response is modularity. You know, how, how could um, reduce that complexity by splitting it into complicated pieces that people could adapt, adopt, and connect? Independence, uh, many of you probably will see that there's so much research uh, now being driven by policy, like a policy, like national policy, whether here in Australia and Europe, many, many other places. Uh, and there is a place, a very important place for independent research, which is not driven by that. And try to identify solutions and push them uh, forward uh, that could complement uh, this research, which is uh, driven by policy or uh, driven by the policy of funding uh, institutions. Um, one important challenge is that uh, research, uh, typical research uh, routes are quite slow. You know, if you want to publish anything, it takes months. I mean, I've once published a, a peer-reviewed chapter, and it took more than 18 months, 20 months. And that's ridiculous, you know, especially in, in the topics that we cover. 
So there is a need for more speed with keeping the rigor, but also there's a need for scale. You need to find ways to, to scale our rigorous research and, and cover uh, areas uh, faster uh, because of the speed of digital transformation. We need to, if not, you know, move at the same speed, we have to a little bit faster as well. So what's the mission of the BIMI initiative is to accelerate digital transformation. Okay, so that's really the mission, how to accelerate the digital transformation of the construction industry and the built environment. The vision, you know, because many people could, ha could have the same mission, many people would like to accelerate, uh, you know, this, or many people have uh, the same uh, mission to go to Mars, etc. cetera. Um, but, you know, different organizations, different individuals would have different vision. Our vision is to demonstrate new ways of thinking. You know, it, we have these problems that we all know that we could identify new ones, um, but we want not only to f to offer solutions, we want to demonstrate new ways of finding solutions. And if we go a little bit uh, into more details, the goals is to help practitioners to improve their digital competence. Here, the focus is on practitioners. Uh, you know, as as is the first goal to, to focus on the individual. To assist organizations, of course, to, to uh, adopt and adapt and to customize and to change or the available solutions to, to suit them so that they can be more productive. And to support policymakers, and this is very important, in, you know, in, in developing the strategies, the, the, the roadmaps, etc., that will uh, encourage digital diffusion across whole markets. And this is part of the, the research at scale uh, agenda, if you wish. So in discussing uh, BIMI initiative, it has several components, and I'm going to be covering uh, one more than the other two. The first component is this common knowledge uh, structure, and I'll cover it in detail. And then there's uh, projects, so we've got the structure, and then this structure is uh, needed to deliver a project, projects which has their own deliverables, and a community of researchers, an international community of researchers. So uh, today I'm going to be focusing on uh, knowledge structures, a little bit on projects, and a little bit on the community. So when we're discussing knowledge uh, structure uh, for the BIMI initiative, uh, it could be summarized in, in this visual model. Um, there's a lot in it, and I'm, I'll try to you know break it into small pieces, hope, hopefully to connect it as much as I can. But you could see here that we have something called foundations or knowledge foundations, something called knowledge blocks, knowledge tools, knowledge workflows, and knowledge views. So, so I'm just going to cover them one by one. So, so when we're discussing BIMI initiative uh, deliverables that I mentioned, all these different tools and resources and workflows, etc., these can only be uh, delivered uh, through uh, research and and uh, starting with conceptual research. And that conceptual reach research is the foundation that we uh, build on, on everything else. And this is very important in order to keep the connectivity between these different um, tools, as you will see, and different projects and different, uh, you know, people working, you know, volunteers. And one major, major difference between what we do and others, uh, you know, potentially do is that we don't ha have uh, solid uh, community structures. We don't have. Uh, like um, chapters and committee, you know, committees and subcommittees and I don't know what, uh, but we focus our efforts around the knowledge foundations, uh, the, the conceptual structure. So these are the the connecting um, skeletal uh, that we all work around. So when we say uh, knowledge foundations, um, there's multiple ways of looking at them. So I'm just gonna use uh, five things. I'm gonna Describe, oh, you, know, you know, I have to go a little bit back to basics and because I'm conscious that there will be lots of, uh, you know, research, you know, early career researchers, students uh, who may be interested in conceptual modeling. Um, then maybe this would be of benefit to them. So we have something called, uh, this, is, this is based on actually my, my PhD thesis, the conceptual hierarchy. Then there's uh, the conceptual glue that connects them. This, you know, how we structure these new concepts how you generate them, and the library that combines them. So based on these knowledge foundations, then we can create something called knowledge blocks and then tools and flows. So, so in this section, I'm looking at the conceptual basis, and I'm trying as much as I can to explain it in detail. 
So when we're discussing uh, knowledge foundations, we have a conceptual hierarchy. So everything that you need to build, whether it is a, a template, whether it's an online tool, et cetera, it must start with, with a term and its description, it must start with a set of terms and the description, a dictionary of sorts. And then these terms need to be combined together into, into sets of classifications, which are a combination of terms using uh, you know, a, a com a one concept that combines them. And uh, by the way, I've, I've on the on the left of the screen, I'm I'm gonna I've placed lots of uh, you know um, references for research students to follow later on. Some of them will have links, some of them will not. Uh, but I'm hoping if you're interested, you can follow these links and learn about these a little bit in more detail. So after a dictionary, after you know, terms and the descriptions, and we combine them into classifications, which is a higher order kind of concept, meaning between a term and its description and the classification of terms and, and concepts is an increase in uh, richness of meaning, of knowledge uh, through these classifications. You can add uh, then uh, you know, multiple classifications and combine them through multiple concepts uh, and you get a, a taxonomy and, and you go up from there. So you go from taxonomies to models, which will model will, will, in, will include um, Diff, you know, different terms for sure. Uh, you know, even the basic Venn diagram is really a kind of a classification uh, with three things. But if you delve deeper, you'll find it's a taxonomy as well. So for example, here, this Venn diagram will have something called players, deliverables, and requirements. And then within players, you have three types. And within deliverables, you have three types, etc. And at the top of this conceptual hierarchy, you have frameworks. So, and in the diff there's lots of definitions of frameworks, but let's say that it's uh, the, the way uh, you know I use it personally, and you know we use it in the initiative is that it's a combination of different models. Uh, so really, it's a, it's a, it's the richest conceptual structure uh, preceding preceding a theory. We're not going to go into theories uh, because th that will take us outside the areas which which is pr practicable, which you know uh, people from industry would understand and could react to. Uh, so it's a, it's a, we stop at frameworks, which is a combination of models, taxonomies, classifications, and dictionaries. Of course, there's lots of theories underlying all this type of work. Um, yeah, and you'll find if you are, uh, you know, you've, you've seen uh, before some of the presentations that uh, uh, something like actor network theory, um, you know, systems thinking, etc. cetera, with, uh, lots of, of, of theories are, a, you know, empowering this type of work. Now, connecting everything, the, the glue, and this is really where the, the, the structure stops, and to glue everything, to glue these terms and with the classifications, with the taxonomies, with the models, with the frameworks, uh, we have a, a conceptual ontology. And if you know, many of us are familiar with the term ontology, uh, but there's many types of ontologies. And, and what we're discussing here is a conceptual ontology, an ontology that connects concepts that eventually could be turned into a, uh, a formal ontology, you know, you know, for, you know, for, for, uh, for a semantic web, etc. cetera. Um, but the focus uh, first is on the conceptual ontology, you know, connecting concepts, uh, discussing topics at the knowledge uh, layer level. Um, once we could understand the problem at that level, we probably be able to have a better grasp of how to solve it at the information and data layers or levels. So when we say ontology, uh, the conceptual boom ontology has you know concepts, relations, attributes, and knowledge sets. You will see there's a link. You can follow that. And this is continuously changing. I, you know this has been the most changing aspect of um, you know the work. Uh, it has never stopped changing, and this will continue to change. I, I don't know if you look at the version history within the document, we'll see it's maybe three pages now. Now, so other than the, you have the the hierarchy and the glue. Uh, you know, it's a and this is to introduce that when we are building anything, as I said, when we're building uh, tools, we need uh, lots of terms. Uh, you know classifications, taxonomies, models, and frameworks. And, and then these are connected, you know, you know, you know you, you, as, as discussed, you could have a classification that has lots of terms and then a taxonomy multiple classifications, and then you have models and frameworks. And then, and, but these are fun to do, of course, but if, if we want to benefit the industry and access the digital transformation, we really have to deliver tools. 
uh, these tools need to be intuitive, usable, hopefully open, and if, if we're really, really lucky, free. But we cannot deliver tools. We cannot deliver anything uh, that is robust without first understanding uh, the terminology needed, you know, defining the terms needed, building our classifications and taxonomies, and, and, and trying to understand the problems and solving them through models like flows, activity flows, etc. And of course, depending on the types of tools we're discussing, some tools will, re will require uh, a really um, high level framework, as you will see in, in, in the, our project uh, for integrated information. Uh, platform, it required the, the development and release publication of a high-level framework because without that framework, we cannot really get to the tool. It's 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 going to be a, a, a it will be dead on arrival, let's say. So, in addition to the structuring, which is really connecting all these uh, terms and classifications and taxonomies, etc., and to build tools, um, but we have to understand. Where do these concepts come from anyway? You know, when we say uh, a model or a framework, and, and really um, there's, there's two things that we could discuss. Um, meaning it's a combination of two things, uh, design science research cycles, which many of you would be, would be familiar with. And really my utmost favorite is the no, no research cycle by Meredith. And by combining these two, we could um, not only generate new concepts, and test them. Uh, you know, you know, we could describe them, we could explain them, we could test them according to Meredith, but also we could um, uh, get, uh, you know, uh, we could understand through the design and science uh, research uh, what is needed by the industry, by the work environment, and to build a knowledge base which could be reused. And this is combined in a in a in a model which was released in the latest uh, paper uh, I've written with my colleague uh, Eric Poirier, uh, saying if we we if we, this is a combination of both cycles. So if we have these conceptual solutions that needed, like it's, you know there is a need, there's a gap uh, to to cover. Uh, where do these come from? There is a, there is a a a a push and a pull from the work environment. You know there is problems, challenges that need to be solved. And if it's a new problem or an old problem that hasn't been solved yet, we really need to understand conceptually what's happening and try to model that in, in, in order to uh, explain it and uh, you know, to first describe it and explain it. And, and at the same time, as we are working with, uh, you know, you know, getting this push and pull from the work environment, and because we we don't really start from from a blank slate, uh, we really uh, we have done work before. There is there is a there is another there's a knowledge base of previous conceptual structures, previous models, previous frameworks, previous taxonomies and terminology. You know, whether by a small group of researchers or by the the research community at large. You know, within the within the within the built environment or from other um you know disciplines we could also there's a push and pull uh that okay uh, i need the new conceptual solution but i'm not going to be building it from nothing not from zero it's not it's going to be coming from a previous conceptual solution from previous concept from previous uh, model and adapted uh to the you know the the new problem uh we're trying to deliver a better solution and and through through that you know um, uh, there is there is a, a you know in the middle here there is a, 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 the 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 research cycle of continuous uh, explaining uh, you know description explaining and testing that allows us to generate new concepts and through these new concepts we could feed back into the work environment and really importantly for the BME initiative to feed it back into the knowledge base so it could be reused so so if you want while this is not surprising or nothing new here uh, what's what could be new is that is the reusability of the concepts and you'll you will notice that many concepts that have been developed 10 years ago, 15 years ago, by multiple people are being reused, um, especially if they, they have been developed in a certain structure that allow their reuse. So I mean, if one, one de de delivers a framework or a model directly like that without uh, a, you know, 
explaining the taxonomies, the classifications, the terminology underneath it, and offering these on their own as valid, then that framework is good, of course, or could be good, uh, but the, it could be difficult to reuse it. But if it was made of smaller pieces which are on their own, they, they stand on their own feet, then these pieces could be reused and to develop new frameworks or new models or the, the deliver tools. And uh, I'm not going to explain this diagram. It's too small for the screen, to be honest. It's just, I mean, you could read about it in the in the resources, a link here that is that when with, when delivering tools, like that we at, at, the, at the left side here, the product library, which is really tools and resources delivered by the initiative, uh, we start on, you know, for knowledge objects. You know, we have a five, six frameworks. We have, you know, 50, 60 models which stand on their own. We have, you know, a hundred uh, taxonomy and maybe, I don't know, many hundreds of, of, of classifications, whether it is, uh, and, and, and sorry, many hundreds of term, terms which uh, we could recombine into new classifications and combine into new models. And then when these models have been tested, uh, they could be fed into tools and templates and saved into the library for reuse. So this has been a, a quick explanation of the foundations, like uh, guiding the BIMI initiatives uh, deliverables. Um, it's all about conceptual hierarchies and structuring and reusing of concepts. Uh, but if, if, the, if the work stopped there, really we could, we could not do any uh, tools of benefit uh, to industry. It's really high level. So we do need to um, bring these high level concepts down a bit in order to use them and reuse them. Uh, and this is the, if you want the principle behind developing something called the knowledge blocks. So not knowledge, knowledge blocks are simplification of uh, conceptual pieces into smaller uh, parts, which are modular and could be combined. And I will do this first at the conceptual level and then at the practical level and combined into tools. And I'll just explain this, a couple of them. So there's many, many of these knowledge blocks, um, which is again, a kind of a simplification of all the conceptual hierarchies and links from the foundations into smaller pieces. So for example, we have, uh, Dictionary items, something called competency items, something called model use, something called system unit. Less than 10 of these blocks that we could define and connect. And I'm just going to, you know, introduce a couple. So one block, you know, foundational block, if you remember from the hierarchy at the bottom of the conceptual hierarchy, we have the dictionaries. Uh, so explaining this as a, now as a, as a block. Uh, within a dictionary, uh, we could have something called an item, a dictionary item, uh, which is the way we do it typically is in English. We use that as a, as a canonical language. Uh, and then inside, you know, to define a term, we have lots of fields, if you want to, you know, we, uh, we have the block includes a title, which is the, the term. It could be any term you can think of, a digital twin, for example, you could say, uh, but information modeling, you could say, you know, lean construction, etc. And within that block, there's lots of data, and, you know, metadata term, the acronym, the, the, the summary description, the plural terms so to search through the, you know, um, plural forms, the languages for translation, labels, etc., etc., etc. So here we have just uh, an explanation of a single. Um, instance of a dictionary item. You know, a dictionary item is kind of a content uh, unit, you know, that we could evaluate on its own. You know, we could look at it, say, does this make sense? Does this term and description and synonyms and et cetera make sense? And then we could combine it with other things uh, in order to create classification and taxonomies, et cetera. But first, we, that building block, uh, that knowledge block, that the smallest knowledge block need to be well-defined and semantically connected. Another block we, we, we refer to as a model use. A model use is a kind of, uh, we, we ref, there's a, you know, a, a kind of a taxonomy called information users and sign information users. There is a model use and document use and data use. Man, man, 
you can go online and you will find some some information about that. But as a, as a blocker, a model use also has its own fields and categories, etc. And I've just highlighted a couple of things, which when you're defining a model use, what's a model use? Uh, you know, it is it is what kind of information you can expect to generate uh, from using 3D uh, digital models, okay? So when we're discussing information, and you'll see this in, in the latest framework published, information could be represented through uh, models or could be represented through documents or data, you know, you know or, or a combination. Uh, but, but in order to reduce complexity, you cannot just say, uh, let's share information. You have to define how it's represented, okay? How it's delivered, and maybe you can use the term container uh, if you want. Um, so when we're discussing a model use, uh, it has its own data, metadata, but also I'll just highlight a couple of things which are overlap with the dictionary item. Of course, it's much more than that, that overlap between a model use and a, 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 and a dictionary item. I just highlighted a couple here. Like a summary description within a model use is a summary description for a dictionary item uh, for that model use. It's also for extended descriptions. So we're discussing these blocks, knowledge blocks. And this, uh, you know, the, you can see here there's five types. So a competency item, dictionary item, model use, a defined role, learning unit. Um, the idea is that by defining each to, to uh, on its own and making sure it is accurate, it is uh, you know defined in a rigorous way, it is semantically uh, structured uh, in a, in a, in a uh, semantically uh, you know structured enough, uh, we'll be able to connect it to other blocks. Uh, so this is an example of a competency item, and a competency item is what you would define a, 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 a like a, the ability of someone. So for example. Uh, you, you can ask a question, do you have the ability to generate a bill of quantities from a well-structured, uh, you know, BIM model? Or it could be defined as an activity, go ahead and generate, you know, it could be in a, in a task list, or it could be an outcome, you know, but that's called a competency item. And inside that competency item, you will see there is uh, something called bill of quantities here. That bill of quantities is actually is a dictionary item. Um, a model use also you could see here, you know, model-based clash detection and cost planning. These these two are model uses. They are uh, knowledge blocks, but they're also uh, dictionary items. And within that dictionary item, there's lots of competency items needed to deliver them. And if we're defining roles or functions, uh, any any you know any function you can think of uh, doesn't have to be a formal role or or, or anything. Uh, you could define it using a mixture of information uses, model uses, document uses, uh, data uses, and inside that, a multiple multiplicity of competency items, and inside that, dictionary items. So when you're building a role or a learning unit, uh, it is these blocks, although they need to be understood, managed, integrated on their own, they also need to be built using these different blocks, which are a little bit more understandable than saying frameworks and models and taxonomies and classifications. They are they are defined in a way that uh, you know uh, any any informed practitioner would be able to interact with a dictionary item, or interact with the model use, or interact with the competency item without needing to understand all the frameworks and models and all these conceptual uh, structuring in the background. So this is the main principle of the of the uh, knowledge uh, blocks. And knowledge blocks on their own also are still not usable on their own. You know, you, it, they are better understood. One could look at them and say, oh, now I can build a tool from it. So it, they are ready to become uh, the, the material for building a tool. And this is very important. So, so, so this is one of the things that uh, the initiative focuses on. It's not, it's not about building tools. Uh, it's about providing the components for building tools. Okay, so that's really the main task. Of course, we will build exemplary tools for people to, to see what could be done. Um, sometimes nobody would want to build these tools, so we build them. But the idea is um, it's about de delivering these blocks so others could build tools, whether they are a series of competency items and hundreds or thousands of them, hundreds of dictionary items, hun you know, you know, more than 70 uh, model use set that could be combined into tools. A couple, couple of tools here. This is like a static tool, an old tool, still one of the most used uh, templates, uh, you know, and downloaded. 
translated from the initiative, the Maturity Matrix, which is really uh, intended for organizations to self-assess their level of capability maturity. And as you know, this is built on top of uh, you know models about uh, and framework about capability maturity, models about capability, and models about maturity. And then you've got taxonomies um, uh, related to the competency or capability sets, and you've got uh, lists, which you know a, a simple list about maturity, which at the same time is a model, etc. So even when you when you see a tool, you really you are looking at uh, the distillation of these conceptual pieces into something that a practitioner or a, a you know a researcher could take and use so either a researcher will take and build new conceptual pieces or you know for their own use or a practitioner will take that and create their own tool or use a sample tool another uh, type of tool more dynamic uh, you know is the you know online platform uh, we have, uh, this is our first, which is the BIMDictionary.com. I'm hoping many people already know what that is. If not, please uh, go and have a look. And if you remember from defining the dictionary item as a knowledge block, uh, we've got all these uh, set A and set B defined in that dictionary item. And you will see them now when you go to dictionary.com, uh, you will see them uh, presented to you as a page. Uh, you, know, you don't really care that was a block and how it's connected and you know uh, you know what's the, the the connections between them what's important for the end user is to search for something or explore something find information learn from it and if we have time today I'll show you a little bit more extensive um, example of this but what you see in front of you is just one page, uh, which has a summary description, which has in the virgin version, you have uh, the extended description, you have the rich media here, all the things that you can see uh, when defining the knowledge block. So really, here you can see um, the tool built using um, one time, here, here it's representing in this page, I'm showing you it's representing a dictionary item. But you, there's other pages which represent a model use, which will have embedded dictionary items and embedded competency items as well. Knowledge flows or activity flows or workflows are how we connect uh, uh, how we how we connect knowledge you know, meaning when for, for knowledge to become more usable it, it needs connection of concepts and their relations. Uh, it's not enough to say this is a, a, you know a set of terms. Uh, it's not enough to say uh, this is a, a, a model use. Uh, you have to explain, you have to describe, explain, and test how these are generated and also how they can be used. And uh, really, the, uh, to express expertise, uh, there's nothing clearer than using uh, flows. And flows are kind of models, if you wish, and uh, as you all know. and just give you a couple of examples generated in the you know the initiative. So, for example, here you you see a, a, an activity flow diagram uh, for generating something we refer to as extended descriptions. Uh, extended descriptions are, as you've seen in the dictionary tool, are the you know they, they are the, the encyclopedic entries for a dictionary. So, the dictionary has lots of terms. Each one of them will have a summary description, but we have also a strategy. And it's online. You can can download it. Can can read it to develop 500 of these terms, to include an extended description, to add um, videos and uh, you know uh, activity uh, flows and etc. And and here you'll see uh, the flow to do that. You know how we're gonna do it. Who's gonna do it, etc. So part of the initiative is to generate uh, lots of these. Um, and actually, just to, if I put my consultancy hat on for five seconds. I say, if you go to a company, you want to assess their capability, maturity, you know, and, and the readiness, even for digital transformation, the most telling uh, thing, you know, the most telling aspect, artifact you can find is their process flows. If they have them, if they're updated, if they're well connected, etc. So we, we, this is a lesson, you know, learned by the initiative and everything we do is based on 
activity flows which are continuously updated uh, combined into strategies that are available uh, openly for people to 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 see uh, to improve upon etc another example here from another project which is uh, I'm going to discuss briefly later on which is a project for software classification this is a, a new project we, we just started um, it's about delivering an online module to help uh, uh, you know, practitioners identify the most suitable tool for a specific uh, digital deliverable or target. Um, also includes the development of guides, etc. Another example of flows are, you know, these. This is coming uh, from, um, you know, it's connected to, to multiple things, including model uses. I, but I, the reason why I'm showing you here this third example is that when when we're developing these activity flows uh, it's not really useful to have one single uh, flow covering the whole initiative or one single flow covering a project or even one single flow covering a micro project what about you know you know one single flow covering a model use is even not you know feasible so the the way the initiative tries to reduce complexity is by first delivering or developing adaptable flows, but also by making these activity flows modular, meaning you could start at a certain height, if you start conceptual level, and then you can drill down to different levels. So it's a, it's really based on a combination of uh, you know, you know, business process modeling and, and notation and case management modeling and notation. We haven't gone too much into YAML yet, but the way we're, we're, we're progressing, it will be a combination of all this in order to uh, describe the problem, identify the solution, describe it again and explain it and test it. We did all these workflows. But in order, even if we find a solution, that solution could not be presented in, in, a, in a complex way. So that's why it's important to also develop a language for presenting a solution. and and and. Although we're, we're we, this is a bit not BPMN, it's we, we, it's a bit more stylized, but this is uh, partly intentional, partly uh, not intentional. But the, the, the part which is intentional is uh, we, we want to identify the the shortest, the simplest way to uh, to describe, explain a, a, a complex uh, problem, and by making this simplification through modularity through sometimes stylization through visualization we're really enabling the practitioner and the organization to 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 take these and to adopt them to their own use improve their own workflows by changing things so we're offering all this not only openly but also we're providing the seed to generate new ones and if we have time i'll show you what i mean so we covered covered uh, the knowledge foundations, you know, uh, all these uh, concepts, and then, you know, how they are distilled into blocks and how the blocks are used to generate uh, tools. And in order to, to generate tools, we have to develop lots of these flows. And within the tools, also will be flows. And if, and these activity flows could also be uh, an end product in, in, on their own. We really have to present them. And this is just a uh, you know, you know, a knowledge view is like a database database, database view. We're just all this uh, information, knowledge, all these different connections. They need to be presented uh, to you know different people in various you know, in, in ways that suits suits them. So some of these could be publications, you know, peer reviewed publications. And this is the, if you want the bedrock of any knowledge foundation. So any anything we do must start. With with some you know a, a framework or a model which has been published in a peer reviewed journal journal maybe not so much peer reviewed uh, books anymore because of the speed so journal is the is the preferred one uh, at the moment and and then uh, also peer reviewed between brackets here resources which are we have a we have a, a, a second uh, level of peer review or 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 a level multiple levels of peer review certain things need to be peer reviewed externally by uh, you know uh, journals and uh, certain things are peer reviewed internally so for example a specific resource which you can't really publish in a journal but still needs to be peer reviewed by specialists and we really our community is is, is 
it's made uh, it is for specialists or have so many specialists but still we have to still do a peer review in order to make sure that a new classification or new taxonomy a uh, new term uh, a new term connection are uh, understandable uh, are well described and, and you know can be tested they are testable and so really could be uh, these types of publications or these types of resources. And, 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 and one of the challenges uh, is to, to move from, from disjointed publications. So, so really from publish, publications by one individual or two individuals to a publication by, by a group within the community, like a project team or a micro project team. Um, many of these uh, peer reviewed uh, public publications or journals um, expect individuals to to you know and 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 uh, loosely coupled teams uh to deliver a, a paper um we we also it's it's challenge for us to 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 uh, work on these two levels and this is one of the things that we're trying to improve upon um currently we have lots of people with different their own uh, peer reviewed journals and you know and thesis etc and one of the challenges is to find ways also to jointly publish um, uh, community work. Another, you know, this is just a couple of examples of uh, resources. So, so this is a, one of them is a competency table. Uh, this is the 201. You can find it online. People can use it to to develop uh, functions, roles, uh, learning materials. It's you know um, many things could be built. Based on that, another one, the model use table. Knowledge views also, you know, could be outlets and channels because we this this knowledge is intended to accelerate the digital transformation of the industry. So really, you have to reach the industry, and to reach the industry, you have to define it. You know, what's the industry? What's academia? And how do you, how you get to them? And and really, you know, and this is this is a a major challenge and a major uh, uh, you know set of activities within the initiative, and it has its own project, as you will see, in order to identify the best ways to reach uh, the audience. Uh, so so it could be through knowledge sharing outlets, as we call them. Like today, you 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 know watching a, a video on YouTube. It could be a, a an industry blog. It could be a, a research focused blog. You know with uh, you know higher conceptual content. It could be through our website. Uh, you know the BIM initiative bimexcellence.org website, which is really a content management system. It's a, it's a WordPress uh, with lots of plugins and in the background. So in order to deliver the knowledge for someone who who wants to start from web page. Uh, and then from there, we could take them to a video, we could take them to a blog, we could take them to a dictionary, et cetera. But also, it's about you know connecting with different groups through different social media channels. And as you all know, you know each channel will have its own type of audience. You know, the audience in Facebook is different the one in LinkedIn and Instagram and Twitter. Of course, there's hundreds of these. We're focusing, of course, on the main ones, but it depends really on the goals. You know, what are the goals of the initiative? If the goals of the initiative is to help practitioners, we could pull some practitioners to us, you know, and but also we have to find these practitioners and push something to them. And I'm just going to give you an example of one of these channels, which is the Instagram channel, which is um, launched nearly two months ago. And this is a simplification, a visualization. It is it is kind of a, a, a an attraction of a younger audience to interact with the BIM dictionary, to to look at the term, read it, benefit from from it, hopefully, and 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 really, you know, not only to like it, but to go to the dictionary and uh, investigate more the topic. One term will lead to another, and from one from one term to another, you go to a to a list. From a list, you go to a resource, etc. And and Instagram has a very you know uh, different uh, you know you can see from from the age, for example, uh, bracket, which is very different to the people who are subscribed to the uh, BIM Think Space, for example, or the people who visit uh, the BIMXSense.org website, etc. And there's lots of Brazilians, as you can see. So, after explaining the, you know, the, the basics about the initiative, 
and uh, the knowledge structure, the conceptual hierarchies, etc., and uh, you know, the knowledge blocks, etc. So all this really, they are all intended to deliver outputs, as mentioned, you know, tools and templates and this, etc. And in order to deliver these, uh, uh, you know, using uh, more than one person. Uh, you know the efforts uh, combined efforts of more than one person we really need to to uh, combine these efforts through a project or a micro project now i don't think i have time today to explain the dynamic nature of these projects i'll try but the principle uh, in the initiative is that we have you know this connected knowledge as mentioned also we have connected projects so each project feeds into the other uh, you know we have the Project uh, A BIM Dictionary. Uh, there's a project specific for knowledge organization and sharing, which takes care of. I'm going to explain this in a little more detail. Uh, one project focused on competency and learning, performance improvement within organizations, macro adoption at market scale, and integrated information. These are the top level um, projects, and they are interconnected. So every project will feed into another. You know, you will you will see it um, in the things I've already presented. You'll see it in the things I will present uh, also with the remaining of this uh, session. So if we look at each of these projects, high level projects, we have only six level you know, high level projects. Um, uh, BIM dictionary project. Uh, you, I've already covered that. What's the you know the the purpose of that? Well, it's really to, to host uh, the knowledge blocks, uh, the dictionary items, to make them browsable, uh, to make them, you know, uh, findable, uh, to, it's the, it's to, to connect them semantically, uh, you know, as we improve our database structure as well, we'll add more things. But it is really our knowledge base. So this is where uh, the starting point to connect to all other projects. So, so you can go from there and go to other projects. It is where you start with the term and its description from its extended description, from its connection, and then you go to other uh, places. It's also has a, another practical um, reason is that it is it is it's a repository uh, that we could connect to. If you so so if we generate uh, whether it is uh, yeah, you know any kind of digital resource, it it will use the dictionary um, yeah, to define terms in different languages. Currently, there is a you know close to 800 terms, 771 terms. Uh, you know these will continuously increase. There is of course a, a saturation level which we haven't reached, but you know it we, we will reach it in, in the next couple of years. I mean it's a long-term project, of course. Currently, I have 25 languages. Uh, some of them have finished translating more than 700 terms. Others are you know still in the first couple of sets. But we have 25 languages, and you know, there's more languages also being now, um, you know, developed. There's uh, the BIM dictionary because it connects everything. Nearly, not all, but nearly every volunteer who works in the initiative has some kind of role within the dictionary. So either they are a, an a editor of a language, a co-editor, or a, or a or a reviewer. Uh, some of them are authors for extended descriptions or for, for model use templates within a dictionary, but nearly everyone has some kind of role within uh, the BIM dictionary. So that's a BIM dictionary. We can, you know, I'm hoping that you know it already. So I'm not going to spend much time on it, but if you want, please, you know, there's, there is a, you know, it's quite intuitive. You can hopefully you can use it, you can create lists, etc. And over time, we will add more modules, um, you know, for searching for software tools, for, you know, many, many things. The second uh, project, we have six projects, or so, uh, project B, it's about knowledge organization and sharing. And, and you'll see, you know, you know, most of the things I presented today fall under this, this really, this project. But, but the idea is that, you know, under, under this project, it's, it's just about taking all this unstructured information and just making them um, more structured, you know, or, you know, fully structured for use by computers or semi-structured for use by, um, you know, computers plus, uh, you know, machine learning and humans, etc. So the idea is of this project is to organize, organize and organize more. Uh, because if, if knowledge is our backbone, is our skeletal, that everything works around, it's not the project structure, it is more the knowledge structure. So we have to continuously uh, structure, restructure, combine, 
connect um, and, and, uh, and it's really, it's never ending work to continuously organize and reorganize uh, knowledge. Uh, and, and this could take many forms, whether it's a mind map, a, you know, a you know, complex concept map, et cetera, doesn't matter, but everything needs to be kept connected, okay? Uh, if it's not connected, then the BIM initiative won't work. It's, it's not like we have six projects and each project has their own deliverables and they can go in their own way. That, that would be failure uh, if that happens. So, so it's very important. It's a key deliverable. It's a key responsibility to keep everything connected. Knowledge is organized in different ways. It's just a simplification. So resource numbering, we have you know, a, a specific way of numbering resources. And now in order to help in knowledge dissemination and sharing, uh, providing some citation help on pages within resources. Uh, now the resources carry a digital object identifier for easy easy reference and in order to for version version control, you can always go back to all the versions and you know we have you know versioning and archiving we're using an open public library so so it's not just us hosting materials on our uh, content management system putting them on on an open public library where it, it provides us with our uh, doi etc I've, I've covered many of these things but this is the the project which which really uh, uh identifies the need for knowledge organizations manages the the process of organization and continuously improve it over time and um, and and it also it's you could see this expressed uh you know if you go to bimaccess.org you will find that uh, we also have in addition to the dictionary items in addition to the conceptual uh, ontology you also have topics and these topics are used in different ways that could be used to identify to to um, maybe to organize dictionary items within the dictionary so you could search uh, by standards so show me standards that's a you know you know a, a kind of topic inside the dictionary or we use these topics in order to organize assessments so, so we say this assessment will cover these topics and you know Etc. Um, we have, um, as I mentioned, six high-level projects, but we have tens. I mean, eventually, we'll have hundreds of micro projects, and and there is a list online. You can go and search and see its status. Um, and the principle of, of projects and micro projects really deserves its own session because we, we try as much as possible to, to keep that as organic as possible. So we only have six fixed ones, but micro projects subdivide very easily and recombine quite easily as well. And um, maybe this time I'll explain this in more detail. So it's, uh, we need to keep this um, as dynamic as possible. And of course, you know, part of organizing knowledge is organizing. Uh, you know, volunteers, our our valued colleagues who are putting their time and effort uh, to help and to improve uh, the digital transformation in our industry. And over time, we will combine these with their competency profiles um, in order to identify the most suitable uh, micro project for them, etc. So everything is interconnected, and this project is what keeps them connected. Knowledge sharing, I already covered this. We have an open forum, so you can go to forums.bimaxinance.org. We videocast and podcast. We have only one podcast at the moment. There is a series planned soon. Social media already covered it. So this is the project really which manages all, all this. Two projects are already uh, predefined, but uh, currently they have not been launched. So this project has not been formally launched. Uh, this is about digital uh, competence. And what you know, assessment of competence about using competency-based uh, learning. So really, um, if we believe, if, if we if we uh, we we agree that that digital competence is nowadays uh, is a necessity for any uh, discipline profession um, within our industry, outside an industry, uh, and digital competence really uh, could branch into you know many many fields and many multiple levels. But but the, the essence is. Nowadays, especially now, you know, after the, this pandemic, you can see the importance of, uh, you know, digital competence. Um, and I, the idea that we need to connect digitally before connecting physically. Yeah. And so the BIM initiative will, will focus a lot on this. Uh, it, it has developed, it will continue to develop, it will maintain a competency-based language to be used in assessment. Um, we already use it in assessment for macro 
we will assess that we, we will continue to, we will deliver more competency based learning material in the future so this project is not launched i can't really cover it in any detail but the general thing is that language this competency based language will be structured semantically structured uh, it will be of course modular connected and will be kept open Another project which hasn't been launched uh, formally yet, and this is also part of the principles of the initiative. So it, st it started with six projects, even if uh, there's nobody working on these projects, because it's the it's the nature of the the thing. It's it has to be connected. So if you you need to connect it, you have to and at least from the beginning uh, understand what are the connections we need at the high level, and from the beginning. Uh, you know, uh, the idea is that we need a strong terminology. We need strong uh, knowledge foundations. We need strong competency-based language and strong performance assessment and improvement within organizations. So this project will focus on building the digital capability maturity of organizations. So again, when you use the term BIM here, it means any kind of uh, digital transformation um, enabling sets of technologies, processes, and policies, et cetera. The fifth project is macro adoption project. This is uh, also it has been launched. Uh, it's uh, active. It is has delivered uh, quite a lot of really uh, things uh, that uh, has been you know uh, of benefit hopefully to 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 policymakers. Um, I haven't mentioned all the colleagues uh, you know here because I, I mean, there's 130 plus of them, but you can see under each project is uh, uh, names of the. The, the people who are co-leading the project. So macro adoption project, we've done some benchmarking and this was published. And then we've done some detailed studies in 2017, 2019. And now we are you know, really reviewing everything. We're developing uh, new key uh, adoption indicators. We will be launching very soon, uh, uh, you know, macro adoption studies to cover many countries at the same time. So really, we learned quite a lot from our, you know, just these experiences uh, of the past uh, nearly five years. And now we're uh, refining the assessment method, um, the, the, the strategy uh, you know, for, for assessing um, you know, macro adoption topics. And we're developing uh, better tools to capture that. Uh, and this would be launched very soon. Already, the strategy has been has been finished, and it's now circulating within the community, and it will be published uh, hopefully either this week or next week. Examples of things that have produced this is just a small example, like uh, with, you know studies in Ireland, which you know help develop uh, you know their roadmap for for adoption. You know, in Spain, we've done a couple of these in Spain in collaboration with uh, Building Smart uh, Spain. Uh, we've done really good work with uh, in Quebec, Canada, in collaboration with uh, GBQ Group BIM to Quebec. Um, which are one of our supporters as well, and they've they've uh, published their adoption. They've done an assessment, and they've published their uh, macro adoption um, report. You can download all these when you go to bemexens.org. You'll find lots of completed uh, studies. You can download the reports, and you'll see that our affiliates include universities, uh, you know, communities of practice, like uh, you know, and uh, you know, many many names that you will recognize. The sixth project and the final project in the set is the Integrated Information Project. This is the most ambitious project, okay? This is a project that will, in will include tens of um, micro projects. Um, it's about information flow. It's about information transformation. It is, I mean, if you haven't had, had a chance to read the, the journal paper, please, I invite you to, to have a read. It is offering, let's say, an, an alternative way of looking at information flow, information management, information transformation and exchange. Um, and for each of the, the things introduced in this paper, this will uh, will include uh, the, the, you know, it's already, many of this already uh, published uh, within the blog or gonna be become a resource or become a, a modular tool. Um, you will see there's lots of these, uh, you know, packages uh, that need to be delivered in order to 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 enable the delivery of uh, open access 
or even open source integrated information platform. So we want to deliver the the the, the blocks needed, the, you know, all these uh, classifications and taxonomies, uh, or, or hopefully even the, the ontology needed, like the formal ontology needed to deliver an open access integrated information platform for managing information across an asset lifecycle. Please have a read. Inside this project, multiple micro projects and work packages too, which are already launched and they have their, you know, some deliverables and, and, and strategies uh, published. Uh, the model use template, uh, I've already discussed that. You could also see one of these uh, templates in the dictionary. If you go to clash detection, uh, you will find there is a, a really uh, an extensive um, um, set of, you know, lots of information, rich media, uh, activity list, competency items uh, there. Um, so the model use templates macro project, also the software classification macro project already mentioned. So this is part of the integrated information project. Community. So uh, so so we've got all these knowledge foundations, or, or you know we've got these projects to deliver these uh, outputs, these tools. But who's doing all this? You know, it's these people coming from. From these are specialists coming from 40 plus countries. Um, I, I don't know, they're more than 40, but 40 plus. Um, they are professors, students. We've got Professor, uh, you know, uh, Regina Rochelle from from Brazil. We've got Mohamed Kasim from UK. We've got you know Assistant Professor Eduardo. We've got Professor Bogdan from. Albania, we've got we've got lots of you know not lots but we have a substantial number of professors with lots of masters students PhD students we have lots of practitioners um, so the community is made of a combination professors and students practitioners and academics um, and uh, and we, we are careful to for the community to be repre not represented because it's not about representation it it's more about uh, capturing the expertise of different age groups uh, you know and to make it as equitable as possible and as distributed as possible and as flat as possible everyone who joins the, the initiative will have to agree to these principles meaning i'm hoping these have already been understood in in the in the, in the, in the presentation like without you know naming them but if for any volunteer who who has joined us or wish to join join, join us? Do they need first to be uh, understand that we everything we do uh, must follow these principles. Uh, you know, it we, we have to be committed to openness. I mean, there's no benefit in, in, in anymore. You know, if, if ever there was in doing things uh, behind closed doors or behind uh, you know a copyrighted material that uh, can barely use. Uh, you know, it's we have to be. Open. We have to 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 offer things under you know you know Creative Commons. Uh, we we this is one of the first principles. So second principle that everything we do must um, has a structure or must interconnect. And um, you know the first section covered these knowledge structures. I know they're not easy to understand at the foundations level, but most people will understand them at the block level. You know, and when they see the blocks, when they see the exchange items, when they see the, you know, um, the model uses. Everything is peer sourced and peer tested. We, we are a group of peers. I mean, you know, you know, 130 people. We are we are specialists, uh, but at the same time, um, we do our internal review. We, we do cross review with between projects, but also for for high, higher level structures like frameworks, they have to be peer tested uh, through publication and through testing within uh, organizations. And we have to be committed to open innovation. It's, it's across boundaries, across borders. So again, this is the principle that we could not, uh, we should not uh, focus on local issues first. We should focus on common issues first, and then localize. Uh, we have to accept that you know by by do, by being innovative and staying open, everyone benefits. Uh, we have to be not only working in a single language in a single country we have to work across these language and geographic boundaries and every every volunteer who joins any of these projects they have to assign um the excellence manifesto you know we could we, we do not work with people who do not sign the excellence manifesto 
Um, the manifesto is open for anyone who would like to sign it. So, you know, about detailing uh, the general principles, you know, about being open, about everything being educational, about being visual, visual and reliable, etc. You can visit, uh, you know, bimexons.org and, and see the manifesto. If you agree with it, please uh, put your name, uh, add your name to, to, the, to the many names there. Community uh, mentioned, uh, you know, last time we counted maybe a month ago, 134, but we projected to grow uh, uh, in 2021 275, maybe a little bit more, maybe a bit less. And this is really driven by the projects that are ready to, for launch. And for a project to be ready for launch, it needs to have its uh, first, its you know, conceptual structures ready. It needs to have the, the right, uh, you know, uh, leader or co-leader in order to launch a, a project, meaning someone passionate about it, have specialty in it, has the right competency profile. But based on what we know, based on the micro projects, uh, we think we're gonna, uh, you know, have uh, within our community uh, at least 170 people. But this is not the amount of people who are gonna be contributing. These are the people who are actively working within the community you know if we if we just do 50 or 100 extended descriptions that that's another 100 whether they join us or they just contribute the material we, we, that would be up of course every collaborator every affiliate finally and this is very short meaning so, um, maybe have too much time i don't really know uh, our challenges our internal challenges and then we can have a discussion um so so what are the challenges? So, so there's lots of benefits of doing things through a community. We are independent. I mean, of course, you know, uh, independent as, as possible. Uh, we could we could focus on specific problems without being guided by a policy or a standard or, or a funding body. Uh, we could connect our work uh, over long periods of time, which is really not uh, acceptable within, you know, certain institutions. So we, many of these projects take multiple years to deliver the aim you know you know by addressing these challenges there's 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 one thing that we're always careful and this is a challenge you know how to keep the autonomy of community players of community researchers without chaos you know you don't want also over regulating you know what being delivered and by whom so so this is why the knowledge structure need to be robust but the project structure flexible so in order to enable autonomy, you know, to deliver specific things, uh, but without having conceptual chaos. We want to organize, we're trying to organize, but we, we want to avoid bureaucracy and it's, it always creeps, uh, you know, on, on us, you know, and anyone who's done any community work will, will know that this will kill the community. You know, it will, if, if, if we started having formal roles and, you know, three stripes and two stripes and, you know, a golden pen and a partner and affiliate, whatever, you know, this is every time, you know, for a small period of time, this is uh, uh, the, the, how the, the, the initiative is organized need to be uh, optimized, need to be improved so, to, so that it, everything could be integrated without bureaucracy. How, one of the challenges is how to motivate people without financial rewards. And it's actually proved easier than expected. And, and, and this is really comes down to who, who you select or who you vet or who comes in, who wants to come in, who, who, who eventually works with others you know, about their motivation, uh, about their passion. It's uh, it's it's uh, of course a challenge, but that's one of the easier challenges. Uh, growth, meaning we have so much things we want to do, but there is a there is a there is a there are certain dynamics. You know, many of you will, will be aware of the, the size limitations for community work, and this is why keeping the project subdivision flexible is very important. Um, but it's a challenge. You know, there's things that need growth. But still, we have to keep the, these uh, flexible community dynamics. So that's really a major challenge. Research rigor. We, we because of the variety of people, uh, you know, working within the community, all specialists in their own, uh, you know, fields. Um, some of them in a couple of fields. It's very important to keep the research rigor, uh, you know, to, to to a level which could be published in a peer-reviewed journal. You know, some minor additional work. So it's it is. I'm not saying that every resource. Is being treated like you would treat, uh, you know, the journal papers uh, submitted, but it's we try to keep it as close as possible uh, to that. Um, 
Uh, because rigor is very, very important uh, uh, to build on. If it's if for nothing, is if, if you want rigor in building a piece that you can depend on building another piece on top or next to. Another challenge is to continuously knit knowledge. You know, all this knowledge is being generated, and of course, we have a skeleton, uh, skeletal. You know, have these structures, but these, you know, continuously knitting, continuously, uh, every new term coming in, they, it needs to be knitted with others. And so, for example, and this has been proved a challenge when the, these the standards, the ISO 19650 suite of standards, have been published which caused some grief uh, because we had many things knitted and then a set of terms came in, which uh, uh, most of them do not conflict, but this was uh, maybe a few, uh, you know, maybe 10 or 15 terms, which uh, really we could not avoid, but to recalibrate uh, uh, our definitions or not to contradict with, with it, published international standards. Uh, but it's an ongoing effort, it never stops this knitting and meshing challenges how much communication is enough you know you know you know how much emails how many emails you receive and messages and we have multiple channels which we're trying to find the right balance that's a really big challenge collaboration competition you need to keep competition in a community you know it's it's it's, it's not just about uh you know there's no competition competition is a healthy part of of, of community work but there is a fine balance between uh, you know, internal co collaboration and competition. Trying to get that balance is very important. Simplification through, you know, is 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 a, is a top challenge as mentioned uh, before. Uh, how do we simplify without losing depth? Because there's so much depth and and this all this expertise from so many people, but we want to simplify it. We want to deliver it to industry in in a way that they can use and reuse. Uh, you know, many ways we we simplify through visualization, so modularization, but still it's a challenge. So we have to always keep simplification, you know, at the forefront of all uh, discussions. Another challenge is how to reduce ambiguity without increasing complexity. So again, so 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 if 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 it, this is a different crowd to the to, you know to the one attending here, let's say let's say, you know, how much do you discuss? Um, structures and connections and all these things uh, without really risking the, a massive increase in complexity, at least perceived complexity. But at the same time, if you don't discuss that, if you don't show it, if you don't uh, you know, un, you know, uh, discuss all these things, uh, people say, well, how it was this structured? Where's the rigor here? You know, you know, I don't understand where this is going. So there's always this risk uh, or this balance that is needed between um, Showing and not showing, showing too much will lead to, you know, complexity or perceived complexity, and 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 the opposite is true. Not showing enough may be perceived as ambiguous. So that's that's it. That's the you know a, a short presentation uh, for the BIMI initiative. What it's trying uh, to do, uh, you know, how it is. Uh, structured uh, you know around knowledge brief discussion about its projects and micro projects and uh, i'm looking forward to our um, uh, discussion so thank you again for the invitation uh to present to you i i'm hoping you found uh, you know you know some of what was presented um useful to what you do and i'm hoping that some of you also are encouraged to create their own initiatives. Um, join the initiative, uh, you know, if, if there is a, you know, motivation to, to do so, or there is a, also an availability in a specific project or micro project. Um, but most importantly, it, it, it is um, an invitation to keep our research as open and as possible, only through openness we will all learn uh, from each other and could accelerate the digital transformation of our industry. Thank you. Thank you, Bilal. Thank you very much. Um, you and I uh, understood the, the, all, the whole thing a little better now. So let's, uh, we have some questions uh, here in the, from the audience. Um, I posted one here uh, uh, about learning material, but then you, you you covered a little bit about this uh, on your presentation. But uh, 
could could you share with us uh, what you're thinking about uh, about learning materials uh, what kind of format or or educational level are uh, are you thinking of yes um committed to competency based language which depending on how we understand it does not really uh, differentiate between levels meaning it is a structure for competence um for the it's, it's the language it's the competency items is the hierarchies of topics that need to be delivered across different levels so meaning you could have a uh, topics uh, which could which, which need to be delivered at uh, undergraduate bachelor level or within you know even a technical school maybe uh, or uh, delivered as training materials within organizations or as uh, you know materials delivered by associations um, the, the the focus here is on the language is on the material is on the connectivity of the language and the materials so that different programs can be built around the same competency structure. So it's, we, will, we will probably de deliver some materials, sample materials for training or for learning, but the focus would be on how could we enable the, uh, the, the generation of competency units uh, faster uh, and interconnected. And you're thinking about uh, printed materials or video or uh, yeah, the media is separate to, to to the to the taxonomy. Meaning, it, it, it is any material could be in principle delivered as a a blog post or as a book. Or you know, of course, the complexity and the number of competency items covered within that would be much different. You know, different, but. As you will see from, as you you know from the BIMI initiative, we we are testing lots of these things. So, for example, we're testing the delivery through video cast or podcast. We tested uh, printing the BIM dictionary uh, in Turkey. So, there's a couple of volumes already released for students in Turkey um, to see if the printed dictionary is useful, usable. You know, we don't know yet. We we we. The focus is on the language, the media comes next, or second. Okay, thank you. We have a question here from uh, Jakob. Can you hear, uh, yep. read? Yep, so thank you, Jakob. Um, uh, so the question is, uh, just in case someone is listening to us, they're not viewing us, um, can you shed some light on auditing and reviewing processes for collaborative collaborative efforts. That's the first uh, questions. Um, we have first, the first step of auditing and reviewing is choosing the right people to work on a project. So, so really, you want to choose, you want to work with people who are rigorous in their work. You know, someone like uh, Eduardo, for example, uh, you know, he, he will uh, forensically inspect uh, any topic and identify issues with it. Okay, so that's the first step. The second step is to have a, a, a process of reviewing and auditing. Currently, within micro projects and to a l larger degree within projects, top level projects, uh, a group of people work together and they, they produce a, a resource. And then that resource is reviewed by another person, like, a, you know, someone with some academic uh, background, you know, someone with a PhD or a, could be a professor who, do, who from outside that project to um, um, review that material. And then uh, publicity is a kind of review. So once you, uh, you you launch a draft version of a list or a taxonomy and make it available openly and say, please you know, help us in improving this, that's like another kind of review. This is of course for the materials who do not require or do not uh, uh, warrant us submitting it to a journal paper. You know, some materials, high-level materials like frameworks, must be submitted to you know high-level journal papers first. That's the first question. I hope the answer was satisfactory. Uh, how much discussion do you have among the large community? This is also a challenge. We have lots of discussions within uh, teams of you know within project teams. So, for example, the macro adoption team that uh, myself and Eduardo, Eduardo and, and Professor Kasim and uh, 
Danny Mugia from, uh, you know, and uh, Christiani. Uh, we meet every couple of weeks now because we are developing our strategy. And and once we, the strategy was finished, it was sent, uh, you know, out for internal uh, review and it came uh, back with lots and lots and lots, you know, and, you know, Eduardo could attest to that of, you know, corrections. Um, uh, it's very rigorous internally. It's, I mean, it, we ask people when they're reviewing to review it as if they are reviewing a journal paper, okay? Um, but it is as close as possible to a journal paper. It's not It's not the same rigor, okay? I'm not claiming that. Um, then we have community meetings. You know, we have one every couple of, uh, you know, months where we discuss a specific topic and people can comment on it, etc. We have forums, we have, you know, you name it. We used to have a Slack channel and we moved to forums. So there's quite, quite a lot of discussion, but could be improved. Um, the third qu question about how do you engineer the ontologies? Okay, we are currently, and we have been looking for someone for a long time to help us with ontology, uh, you know, to move our ontology from a conceptual ontology to a more formal ontology, okay? Some of the things we are developing require the de you know, delivery of a, you know, kind of a, you know, a solution suitable, suitable for a semantic web, you know, that, that level of work. Lately, you know, a couple of people have uh, started discussions about this. So hopefully we will now receive help in, in defining our ontologies. But anyone listening to us who has experience in transferring conceptual ontology into a, you know, an ontology that can be used in a semantic web, please, you know, send, send, send us an email, you know, a, a message. We need you. Okay, uh, let's skip to Johan's question, and then we we'll talk about the dictionary. Yep. Uh, thank you, Johannes. Uh, what role does BIM dictionary play in connection with uh, building smart data dictionary? Uh, a, the focus is very different of the BIM dictionary from that of the good work by Building Smart International. Uh, we are focusing on uh, explaining common concepts, uh, mostly related to process, uh, to the practitioner. We are not covering products. We are not, we don't have a schema like the one, the building smart data chain. They are complementary, meaning if, and this is also, a, you know, a call, we will, we stop short, we, 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 if you want, if, if you imagine, and this is really just an abstraction, if you imagine the work we do, it fits in two layers only, knowledge management or engineering, organization sharing, and now in the, because of project F, information management flow and transformation. We don't cover data flows and data streams and product data, we don't but we are very close to them, you know. So so anyone going from that layer up to information management and knowledge management, we could connect with you. But we, we do not go to the, we do not do what Building Smart does. This is not, this is, the, that's, they're, they're good at what they're doing. We want to support them. We just want to complement them. Let's move back to one of the Jacob's questions uh, about the, the dictionary. Yep, there are lists of most search terms and concepts in the dictionary. What are the upcoming concepts that have not yet been verbalized from your perspective? Okay, thank you, Jacob. Um, we actually now will be focusing on two things. One is increasing the depth of knowledge uh, that you can find when searching and browsing a dictionary. And this will happen by uh, adding extended descriptions. And, and so that one I've showed, but also there is a much more extensive version. If you go and look at the model use template, for example, in a dictionary. And the second is to increase through uh, our topic list. So we have 42 topics, you know, uh, um, could become 45, etc. But we we uh, we are looking through the project A3 is called. Uh, we're looking for topic uh, curators. So, for example, 
one of the topic curators it was about mixed reality and he brought he suggested 25 topics these 20, so 25 terms within a topic and then these descriptions were developed and then they were reviewed and they were published now another topic so our growth if you want to see the growth in in in, in uh, the dictionary please look at the topics list if you go to bmexcellence um uh, dot org and look at the topics list you will see where then the the terms uh, will, will, will follow these topics so it could it could it could, it could be alam you know you know uh, uh, gis uh, agile lean uh, target value design etc all the things that really affect um encourage improve digital transformation within the industry Okay, there's uh, a final uh, great question about uh, policy making. Yeah, actually, Eduardo could answer that. But uh, oh. yeah, so so it's about uh, we we want to enable policy makers to either develop or improve their their strategies and and roadmaps. So, and this is really what we've been doing in the past couple of years through presentations uh, through uh, helping uh, you know doing uh, assessments uh, providing templates for roadmaps and and these are available already uh, so our aim is to distill from assessing multiple markets what are the, the most recommended uh, actions that a policymaker can take in order to encourage adoption and diffusion of tools and processes and policy and, and you know protocols so yes yeah, so we have a role in this but our role is in understanding benchmarking developing guides and templates and stopping that's really it all right we are uh, already uh, one hour and, and 40 minutes in this Ouch. presentation yeah mm. besides the, the my delay yeah. uh, so Bilal, thank you very much. Uh, I think this is a, a great opportunity for uh, publicizing all the work. Uh, I personally had, I had another question, which is how, how, uh, how percentage of your personal time do you dedicate to the initiative? Because mm -hmm. there's so much thinking behind this and so much work. And uh, we know you are the, the driving force behind all this. and the mastermind that gave, yeah with a cat yes the uh, device of this so yeah no, it, it's it is it started as an individual effort okay it's no longer an individual effort I mean, there's the efforts of all these you know 130 and more people um f uh the time spent is uh to be honest uh it's a, it's a time well spent um the type of work I do like, uh, is complementary to this. So even when I'm thinking about work, it is aligned with the initiative. Um, when I'm, you know, thinking about initiative and trying to resolve a connection or, you know, you know, a conceptual structure, it actually helps the work as well. So it's it's aligned, and this has been a strategy, a personal strategy from like from the start. Meaning, if you ever want to do research, I just this is a recommendation for young researchers. Only do it in something that you're really passionate about and you use in your work. Do not follow shining objects. Do not look. Oh, what's now really people are discussing, and let me do research about it. Follow what you like to research and what you will need in your work, and then they will be aligned. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much, Bilal. Uh, thank you, thank all you. the viewers. Uh, we, had, we have another final technical session uh, later on. So, so later, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.